Louise here. Let's, oh, good morning to Bella. Hi, Bella. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's awake. <laughs> Just pass the baby. Um, all right, let's open with a prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for this time that we have um, in fellowship with each other. The community of women is just so valuable. Thank you for this time we have in your word. And I pray that um, you will pour out your spirit into our presence. Right now, Jesus, um, we bring to you any of our own sins and our failings, and we just confess them to you. Our busyness, our hurriedness, um, our self-centeredness, Jesus, we confess them to you. We ask for your forgiveness, that we can enter deep into your word right now. Help us to understand it. Help us to grow through it, that we may know you better. And I pray, Jesus, that you allow me to teach only what is true. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, ladies. So good to see you here this morning. Um, so as you ladies know, we are doing an overview of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we have gone back to the beginning. Um, it, these are called the Law, the Writings of Moses, the Book of Moses by Jesus and the Apostles, also called the Torah in Jewish context. Um, and I've asked the question, why do we study the Pentateuch? And ladies, you can answer this for me. We study the Pentateuch because it's about who? It's about Jesus. That's what he says. He tells um, his disciples that everything written about him and the law and the prophets and the writings of Moses must come true. And so we study the Pentateuch because it is about Jesus. Um, the goal of this class is to look for Jesus in the Pentateuch to see how the kingdom that God establishes in Genesis is fulfilled in Jesus. And so far in the class, we have looked at creation. We've asked, what does it mean to be image bearers of God? And ladies, you can answer this for me. It's two W's, right? Being image bearers of God gives us work. work. Yes, it gives us work that we are called to work for God's will, to work for his glory, to carve um, beauty out of chaos, to kind of carve order out of chaos. And then it's also, it gives us, what's the other W? It gives us worth. Exactly. It gives us worth. We have worth simply by being the image bearers of God. Um, and we've unpacked those a lot more. We've seen the covenant that God establishes with a certain family through Adam and his descendants, then begins, is picked up with Abraham and his calling, that he is called by God to simply follow him follow him. And that begins with that follow me call. And God says, if you agree to be faithful to me, I will covenant with you. And as you ladies know, I like alliteration. And so we get our three P's of the covenant. You can shout them out or give me one of the P's of the covenant. It's I heard, promise, right, that the entire world will be blessed through the descendants of Abraham. So promise. And what else are we getting? Place. place. That there is one place. Canaan is given as an everlasting promise to the Jews people and their descendants if they will walk according to God's laws. And then good. So place, promise, progeny. Exactly. That Abraham's descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. Exactly. So God says that this promise of progeny will come through a biological son. Though Abram is old, 75, when he's called by the Lord, that this promise will be realized through a son from Abram's own body. And we talked um, two weeks ago about how Abraham and Sarah get right? And they decide to try and bring about God's will through their own activities. And that enters um, Hagar into the whole mix. And then we get Ishmael out of it. And, um, but, you know, it's, as we've talked about, does God ever need help in acting his plans, right? We humans think that we need to get involved and bring about his will, but God never needs our help. Thankfully, God's plans occur despite our crazy attempts to do things our own way. So he appears to Abe and Sarah and he says, I love this in Genesis 18, 14, he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? 
And that's, that's just the great takeaway from those stories. Anything too hard from the Lord. And we all saw those in our own lives. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So we saw, last week we saw God test Abram, or Abe, with that sacrifice. He asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And we saw Abe's faith through this. Believing that God's promises would come through Isaac. So even if he did sacrifice Isaac, he believed that God would actually do what to Isaac? He would resurrect him, raise him from the dead. Because he believed so strongly in the promise that God had given him that this promise of progeny would be fulfilled through Isaac. We talked about how the test is not really for God. Because God knows Abraham's heart already. So who is the test for? The test is for Abraham. Oh, the test is that Abraham would know his own heart. That Abraham would realize the strength of his own faith. And then here's the test also for us, also for Isaac. That Isaac would see the faith of his father and that Isaac would see God come through for them. So we see the depth of, both, of Abraham's faith and then we see that also being passed on to Isaac. They both witness God's provision and trustworthiness so that their faith will grow. So today we're going to focus on grown-up Isaac. We'll witness another story of faith actually as we meet Rebecca. Um, and we'll see also the strife that occurs in his own household with the two wrestling twins that are going to come about through Isaac and Rebecca. So let's do just our quick review of Genesis, um, of the context of Genesis. So just to remind ourselves, ladies, who is the author of Genesis? It is Moses, exactly. And we believe this even though he never identifies himself. We believe this because he's qualified. He's an eyewitness to these stories, um, to of the Exodus stories and beyond. The Lord commands him to write down the stories. And the, both the Old and New Testament attribute the Pentateuch to Moses. So internal evidence. Um, and then again, our next who, who is uh, Genesis written to? It's written to the Israelites. Exactly. You have to remember that. It's written to a Semitic, nomadic people group 3,500 years ago. So Genesis was not written to us, but it was written for us. Exactly. And that's so important to remember. It was not written to us, but it was written for us. It was written to a certain people at a certain time with a certain knowledge and a certain worldview, but it was written with the intention of communicating God and his covenant to the future generations to us. So in approximately when was it written? It was written, we believe, before the death of Moses, which would have been it was in 1406 BC. Um, and then what type of writing is Genesis? I've given you the phrase theological history. This is coined by John Walton, who is currently um, teaching in I'm Wheaton, thank you. Went for, left my head for a moment. Uh, he's currently teaching at Wheaton College. So uh, Moses writes real history to teach theology. He chooses events and stories to teach us about who God is and who we are in relationship to him. And that the story of Genesis is the story of God creating a kingdom people, of creating order out of chaos, of pushing back the darkness, of choosing to covenant with a certain people, and of revealing himself to these people and beginning to create his kingdom. So, then the why, why was Genesis written? To teach the Israelites the theology of God and his purposes, which was radically different than the pagan cultures around them. Okay, so as we step back into Genesis today, Abe is about 140 years old, still alive, and Isaac is 40. Uh, Abe is close to his death, and he wants to ensure that Isaac is going to marry the right woman. Many parents have this desire for their children to marry the right person. Um, for Abe, the right woman is going to have certain qualities. So let's step into Genesis 24, beginning in verse 1. Genesis 24, beginning in verse 1. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to his senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? 
Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Okay, let's look at that for a moment. Okay, so Abraham has a huge job. And he's going to assign it to who, verse 2? Who does it say? He assigns it to his, his senior servant. So this will be the one in charge of all of Abe's household, his right-hand man. He, uh, who does Abe not want Isaac to marry? He doesn't want him to marry someone, a Canaanite wife. Yes, a Canaanite woman. So from who should sir, his, the servant get a wife for Isaac? Verse 4, from among Abe's own family and own country. So later, under Moses, the Israelites, will be commanded not to marry the women of Canaan. And do you ladies remember why? Why the Israelites are not supposed to marry women from Canaan? What was that? pollute the purity of their faith. What happens when we marry someone outside of our own faith? False gods. False gods, yes. It creates it. It's easier to worship the gods of other people. Um, it's harder to raise your own children in your own household. It's harder to be part of a church community if you are married to someone who has a different faith than you, who is not a believer. So um, we have to remember that every detail is purposeful as Moses is writing this account. He wants to ensure faithfulness to God. So to marry from among God's people is something that will help ensure faithfulness. So when the Israelites are commanded not to marry the women from Canaan, it's simply so that they will not be led away to worship the gods of the Canaanites. That they want them. It's it's a command for security, for protection. So, uh, verse 5, the servant asks, What if I find a girl for, from your family for Isaac, but she doesn't want to come here to Canaan? He says, Do I bring Isaac back to the land you came from? And what is Abe's answer? Verse 6, No, do not bring him back there. Don't take my son there. Why? Why wouldn't Abe want Isaac to go back to the country that he came from? Any thoughts on this? Why wouldn't you want him to go back? That's not the land he gave him. That's not the land he gave him. Good job. You guys are so Bible literate. God had called him out of that land, right? He called him out of that land. So God had promised Abraham this land to his descendants where he currently lived. So verse 8, if the woman won't return with the servant, what is the servant released from? He's released from his oath. Right, exactly. So uh, from the oath. But Abe believes the plan will be successful. And why? Verse 7, who will God send ahead of the servant? The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord will go ahead of, the, of his servant to ensure that it happens. So the servant swears his oath. He, it's shown by putting his hand under Abe's thigh. This is a common means of making an oath back in the ancient Near East. It's close to the loins, meaning that this oath is to you and your offspring. So that's what it signifies. This oath is to you, but also to all your offspring from you. So it's an oath to Abraham, and it's an oath to Isaac by swearing this way. Um, so the Abe believes Angela will go before um, the servant to provide a bride, and uh, let's watch it unfold. So Genesis 24, verses 10 through 26. It's such a sweet story. All right. Then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram the Ham and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please, 
Let's have your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink. And I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was a daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abram's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful. A virgin, no man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please, give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar into her, to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring, wearing a becca, and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he asked, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, born to Nahor. And she added, We have plenty of straw and fodder, as well as room for you to spend the night. And the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. All right, so the servant heads to a place called Aram Nahum, verse 10. He arrives where? What does it say? The town of... Nahor. So who is Nahor? So get out your genealogy, ladies, and you can see. So Nahor is the brother of Abraham, the father of Bethuel, and the grandfather of Rebekah and Laban. Do you see how those all connect? So Grandpa Nahor seems to have become a prominent man in this town because the town at this point is now bearing his his name. Yeah. So it's the town of Nahor. This is how we used to name things, people. Uh, so where is Aram Nahum? Now, it literally means Aram of the two rivers. Likely, it's part of Syria between Euph the Euphrates River, possibly the Habor River. So it's a, an area between two rivers. Um, the northern part is called Padam Aram, which is where Abe and Terah had first settled after leaving Canaan. So I have to admit to you ladies, I like spent probably at least a half an hour in a rabbit hole trying to figure out exactly where this was. I was probably like, I have to stop. Um, because people play, some people place it really high on the map, like 33,000 or 3,300 miles away from Beersheba, which is where Jacob starts. It seems really far, to be honest, especially because in our next account, which we'll get to next week, um, Laban is going to chase Jacob. Jacob, and he gets to Canaan. So he has not, probably not chased him, you know, 3,000 miles. So it seems that it's likely part of Syria, which is above Canaan, more of a distance of maybe about 500 miles, um, which is, seems a little bit more likely of a journey to undertake. Um, Anyway, so we, I don't know the exact distance that he travels. I really wanted to have that for you ladies, but it was a rabbit hole. Um, but it is a great distance that he travels. Um, the servant, 10 camels, arrive at Aram Nahum, the town of Nahor. The servant goes to the place where he's most likely to find young women. So it was typical for the young women to go every morning and every evening to the town well and draw water from it. It was like the gathering place. It was probably where... We all hung out and chatted when we were young, and this was our job. So verse 11 says, it was towards evening, the time when women go to draw water. And the servant is in the right place. Um, before he even begins his task, though, what does he do in verse 12? He does what? He, he prays. So before he even begins, he prays. So this reminder to us that before we begin anything, ladies, that we begin with prayer. So look how the servant prays. It's really for very specific 
specific direction. Um, and when this happens, he says, I will know you are leading this, Lord. So when a young woman arrives and agrees to give the servant a drink, she also is supposed to do what? Verse 12. She's supposed to offer a drink to who? His camels. Exactly. This beautiful 10 camels. So now, what kind of response do we see, would we see in this heart, the heart of this young woman by having this kind of response? It would A cheerful response? Totally. What else? She's not just giving him a resp- water, but trusting, trusting and respectful. respectful, generous, I heard. Yeah, really generous. Like, this is a generous heart. Like, she's like, oh, I'll help you. I'll also help your camels. Like, that's just a lovely response. So he's looking for the character of this girl by this prayer request he's given. But uh, also... And so the servant can clearly identify the leading of the Lord. Verse 14, for who is the servant looking for? He says, let her be the one who, what? Let her be the one who you have chosen. Let her be the one you have chosen. So this is a great lesson for us ladies in how to pray. I was really thinking about this. First, are we looking for our own will to happen in prayer? No, no, that's not what this says. Prayer brings us in line with God's direction, with God's choice. So prayer is bringing us in line with God. And then why? Because God's macro perspective knows what we need more than we do. So we want to be in line with this greater perspective that sees the past, the present, the future, and knows what is best for us. He knows the good plans he has in store for us and he wants us to walk in them. So with Eve, we saw that saying yes to God is saying no to our own will, right? And that it's not because it's bad to follow God, but because it's good to follow God. It goes that God's ways are so good. I want to be on that path that is so good. Prayer therefore brings us in line with God's good path, the good things that he has in store for us. And with the servant, we therefore ask for clear doors to open and close so that we will know God's will, his good path. I was thinking about this. You know, my son recently um, switched um, playing for two different, playing from one water polo team to the other water polo team. And and um, it's a simple thing, but it has a really big impact on our family. Um, different kids will be around, different coaches. Um, I don't know if this is like his long-term thing, but right now it's really good for him as an 11-year-old boy. He's getting great exercise. Um, he was playing for a team that was pretty far away. And... Um, and there's another team that's close to where we live. And at first, like, I felt like God kind of began to sort of work in my own heart. Like, began to just sort of give me some feelings that were uncomfortable with the current team that he was playing with. So just uncomfortable feelings. Um, I didn't see him progressing. I wasn't sure he was being built up positively. I just had this sort of, like, discomfort. Uh, and I just began praying, Lord, if you want to switch him, you make it clear. Like, you need to shut doors and open doors to make this happen because my son was playing with his friends and you don't just easily move a child who's playing with his friends since that's at least for my son his greatest motivation in life is friends I'm not for my daughter she doesn't care about people (laughs) she'll do whatever she wants to do for my son, the greatest motivating factor is what friends will do there. So, um, so first we had this awesome carpool, and then the carpool literally just fell apart, like for various reasons. The kids could, weren't going, or the moms weren't driving. It was just it fell apart. Then I went to a practice, and the practice, like it just really bothered me. I didn't like the way they were doing the practice. So to me, it just felt like door shutting after door shutting after door shutting. So I convinced my son to try one practice with this new team. I did a pro-con chart with him because <laughs> a little logical. Um, but I prayed, Lord, you know what
what is best for Axel. You know what is best for him. I don't know what is best for him. I don't know which team is best for him, but you know, Lord. So even simple things like this, I believe we pray for because the Lord wants to be involved in all the details of our lives. If, so I said, Lord, if you want him on this team, let him love the coaches and let him feel connected to the kids. Like, this is what I'm asking for. And then I'm just going to know. I'm going to know you're leading here. So when we arrived, he, of course, immediately recognized some other boys that he knew. So that was like one check. And then as we were walking out of this first practice, a coach just pulled him over and complimented him on this amazing throw he had. And so now he's like walking big and feeling like really built up. And um, as we talked later that night, he said, Mom, I'll stick with this new team. And which I was like super relieved for because it is just simplifies our life. It's just so much closer and it's just, and I'm, I mean, I try to make choices that simplify my life. That is one of my big things, not make it harder. Let's be as simple as possible. Um, in many situations, I have prayed more if this is from me, you, let me, huge, let me feel a huge peace. Or Lord, if this is not from you, let me feel huge anxiety. Let me just constantly feel like this nervousness or insecurity about a choice. So and my goal is to let my heart align with the heart of the Lord. To that I would know his will because I believe his will is best for our family. And I believe he cares about the details of our lives. So... Um, so with the servant, we see him praying for clear direction so that he would know very clearly, is this, is this who you have chosen, Lord, for Isaac? To place him in line with God's good path. So I love how verse 15 says, before the servant has finished his prayer, I love that, before the servant has even finished his prayer, what happens? Rebecca comes out. And that's just like this immediate prayer answer. So we learn Rebecca is a relative of Abraham's. She's his grandniece through Abraham's brother Nahor. Uh, we see Re Rebecca respond exactly as the servant had prayed for. I love how in verse 21, what does the servant simply do? He does what? He... He watches. He just kind of steps back and watches. He watches to see, is this the one the Lord has chosen? Is, will his journey be successful? So all, it all depends on the Lord. When he realizes Rebecca is the daughter of Abe's relative, verse 26, what is his response? What does he do? He... He, he bows down, he worships. When he realizes that this is the daughter of a relative, he just, he worships. When we see the Lord answer our prayers for direction, what is our response? Our response is worship, it's thankfulness. The creator God of the universe loves us so much. He cares about the details of our lives. He cares about who we are becoming. That's what he cares about most, who we are becoming. And our journey influences who we are becoming. Following this, Rebecca runs home, tells her mom and brother, Laban, everything. They run out, they greet the servant, they bring him home, they prepare a feast. And the servant says, I will not eat until I have told you why I am here. And he says, I serve Abraham, who has become wealthy and a respected man. Um, and I've come looking for a wife for his son, born in his old age. So I'm kind of giving a little overview of the next section. We notice that Rebecca is Abe's grandniece. Isaac would be a peer with his uncle's granddaughter. Because remember that Abraham has Isaac in his old age, right? So we've kind of skipped a generation of the wife that would be the compatible age. So the servant relays the story how he prayed specifically for Rebecca, how she did exactly what he had prayed for. He kind of goes through the whole story. And Rebecca's father, Bethuel and Laban, recognize God's hands and all hand in all these events. They agree that Rebecca should go, but and Mary Isaac, but understandably, they don't want her to go right away. They ask that she will stay with them ten more days. Um, she's their daughter, their sister, they may never see her again. So, like Abraham, who was called to leave his family and follow the Lord, Rebecca becomes the example of this next here I am, send me kind of relationship. So um, I'm, I've skipped over some verses, but we're going to pick it up in chapter 21, verse 50. 
Laban and Bethel answered, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on our way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. But he said to, the, to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success to my journey, send me on my way so that I may go to my master. And they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's, ser and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you increase the thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. But Rebecca and her attendants got ready and then mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. So Rebecca must have been watching all of this unfold, watching this conversation. She heard the story of the servant. She saw that God had led him specifically to her. And how, how she had responded exactly as a servant had prayed for. She sees her family reacting in excitement for the marriage. I mean, 10 candles and gifts of gold. Like, it looks like a pretty good marriage. But Rebecca has to leave the only home she's ever known, the only family she has ever known, simply because God said, go. I love how the debate begins between Rebecca and his family and the servant in verse 57, and they choose to resolve it by bringing in Rebecca. And likely, they thought she would probably say, no, let me stay 10 days or so. But surprisingly, they call her, they say, will you go with this man? And she says, verse 8, verse 58, she says, I will go. I will go. So this is the heart the Lord wants from all of us, ladies. The will you go question and the answer, I will go. I will go where you send me, Lord. She doesn't know where she is going. She's never met this new husband of hers. She's never been to this new land. But who is leading her, ladies? The Lord. The Lord is leading her. So who is Rebecca's trust in? Her trust is in the Lord. It's not in the camels or the gold. So when the Lord leads, he always provides, even if it's hard. Because the good path the Lord has for us is not always easy. Those of us who have been on this journey of faith long enough know that. His journey for me has been really, really hard at times during my faith walk. But what is the Lord most concerned about? As I mentioned earlier, he's concerned about who we are becoming. That's what he wants the most. He cares about our heart and our willingness to trust him, our willingness to let him make us more and more into the image of Christ. Through our journeys, we are made more and more into the image of Christ. Um, the Navy ladies are the one day I mentioned a book by Jen Wilkin that I've been reading called um, In His Image, 10 Ways God Calls Us to Reflect His Character. And what she says, uh, it just really struck me, she says, we often ask the wrong question in our faith journey. We often ask the question, Lord, what should I do? But God's will is for us to be made more and more into the image of Christ. So she says the better question is, Lord, who should I be? So that's the question that we should be asking in our lives. Lord, who should I be? We can only ask, what should I do? After we ask, who should I be? Since God is more concerned about who we are becoming than anything that we are doing. His path for us may bring us into situations that purposely refine us, purposely shine us more and more into the image of Christ. Often through the hardest parts of our journey is when we become more like Christ. And I think we can all acknowledge that. The path of walking with God is ultimately always good because we become more like Christ. And because he promises his abundant life life now, life to the fullest. So we see a very sweet resolution to the story, Genesis 24, uh, verses 52 through 57. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy, and he was living in the Negev. He went to the field one evening to meditate, and as he was looking up, he saw camels approaching. 
Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is the man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. I love how Rebecca's act of faith does bring about great goodness. That the how does Isaac feel about verse, about Rebecca? Verse sixty-seven. It says he what he loved her. That's such a sweet response. He loved her. He the idea of bringing her into his tent is an act of marriage. In that day, any kind of sexual relationship was considered an act of marriage. So that's how marriage was enacted. Essentially, it was by a covenant, and then um, so. <laughs> bringing her into his tent. So, okay, interesting fun fact from verse 62. Uh, where is Isaac currently living? What does it say? He's living in... He's, Beer Lahai Roy, right? Do you see that? Okay. Um, Beer Lahai Roy is a well. Does anyone, okay, I have to tell you, ladies, I did not remember. Does, does anyone remember who named this well? We've already read this in previous weeks. Okay. Oh, my. You just killed it today. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. I didn't. But... Um, <laughs> You're amazing. You did. Okay, so my commentary actually had to remind me. So Genesis, Genesis 16, 13 through 14. Deb, you're amazing. Okay. Hagar. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the Lord God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well is called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So, this is really interesting because the God who saw Hagar is now the God who sees Isaac and provides a bride for him. It's also really interesting because Ishmael was not the rightful heir to Abraham, and Isaac was the rightful heir. So we see this, it's just an interesting connection of Isaac now sort of assuming this, um, this place, living in this location. So that's something that I would actually almost want to like ponder and think about even more. So if you ladies come up with great connections, let me know. But I thought it was very interesting that this is the place that he's living right now. It's a place that Hagar had met the Lord in the desert and then had been sent back at that point. Okay, so after this passage, we return to Abraham to conclude his journey. Um, it's short and there's not many cultural nuances, so I'll just read the, the end of Abe. So 25, Genesis 25, verses um, 1 through 11. So Abraham, so Sarah has died. Abraham had taken another wife um, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Medin, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba, and Dedan, the descendants of Dedan, were the Asherites, the uh, Latishites, and the Leomites. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephrahanic, Abida, I know, and Helda. All these were the descendants of Keturah. So this is interesting. We don't really go into the story of Keturah, but Abraham does marry someone else after Sarah dies and has a ton of sons. So Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His son Isaac and Ishmael buried him. Notice Ishmael still on the scene. Uh, in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. So he had bought this cave. That's a portion of scripture we didn't go into detail on. He negotiated the Hittites, bought this cave to bury Sarah, and so they bury him in the same place. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who had lived near Beer Lahoi Roy. Okay, so we notice that Ishmael and Isaac both bury their father. Um, the next verses give the lineage of Ishmael. We're going to kind of um, wash over them. Then we return to Isaac and the birth of the next generation of the covenant. So we'll move down to Genesis 25, beginning in verse 19. 
This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Verse 26 says Isaac was how old when Rebecca has the twins? 60, right? And remember, how old was he when he married Rebecca? 40. Good job, ladies. So for 20 years, Rebecca had been barren. She had been childless. Like Sarah, she becomes the next matriarch and the mother of the covenant, and she is barren for a reason. So what does Isaac do? He, verse 21, he he prays on her behalf. I love that. He prays. And this is verse 21. The Lord answers his prayer, and Rebecca becomes pregnant. So verse 22, what does it say, though, about these babies within her? They did what? They yeah. they jostled each other. Okay, so in your um, class notes, I've given you some different Hebrew words. But this first one, uh, jostled, is yitrosas. Oh, I'm afraid I'm not going to say this right. Yetrosasu, which means it comes from the root rasus, meaning a violent collision, crushing or breaking. So a violent collision inside her womb. It's kind of the idea almost of reciprocal blows being given by the twins in utero. Like they are they are just fighting it out in there. So it's it's so crazy to Rebecca that she goes to ask the Lord, what is going on inside of me? This is crazy. And God answers with a prophetic word. It says, two brothers are inside of you who will become two nations. Esau will become the Edomites, Jacob, the Israelites. These two nations will be at war with each other, which we will actually see in later scripture. Um, contrary to tradition at this time, it says the older brother will serve who? The younger. The younger. So that's contrary to tradition. So God says his blessing will go to the younger child that is going to be born. And if God says something, it's going to happen. We see this prophesied conflict between the boys at the at their birth. So Esau is born first, but Jacob is holding on to what? His heel. He's like, holding tight. Like, you can't get up first. So he's like fighting to be born first. And um, so Esau is called Esau because it means hairy, which apparently is what he looks like, which is hilarious. Um, Jacob is called Jacob because it means he grasps the heel. Um, the hitty, the he, it's a Hebrew idiom for he deceives. Uh, I was really curious about this because I was like, who names their child he deceives? So um, I looked it up, and Jacob was actually a really common name in early 2nd century B.C. Mesopotamia. Um, the issue going on here is wordplay. So Jacob is Ya'akob, which actually carries a sense of protection. It's seen in many extra-biblical sources as ya uh, Yaakov Il, meaning may God uh, protect. So Yaakov Il. Um, so the word for heal is Akab. The word for deceived is Akab. So this, that's what, so this word play, Yaakov, is the word play is Yaakab, Yaakab. So it's just changing the vowel. That's the word play that's going on here. And I don't know if you ladies remember, but early Hebrew had no vowels. It it only had consonants. So the word Ya'akob, it's just the way it would be pronounced to be Ya'akob or Ya'akab or Ya'ak or Ya'akab. So the similarity in sound is what brings out this nuance of heel and deception. So Jacob is given this name with nuance at his birth. 
you would think it would be a hard name to carry. I mean, maybe that wasn't the original intention. Maybe they intended it to be this idea of protection, but it became known sort of the, with this wordplay. But Moses then immediately is going to tell us the story of Jacob's first deception. So Genesis 25, beginning in verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. It literally means red stuff. Give me some of that red stuff. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Edom means red. And Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. What? I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Okay, so Esau and Jacob are called boys, or not are. So anyone male up to about age of 17 is called a not are. So these, they would be young men, but merely like teenagers, most likely, for this showdown. Uh, Esau is called a hunter. He liked hanging in open country. The nuance of Hebrew is that he's kind of like being called a big brute. <laughs> he's like a little uncivilized, but um, possibly tall and handsome as well. He's sort of this man of the outdoors. Um, Jacob, other translations call him a quiet man. The nuance is actually kind of an ordinary man. Um, he's seen as like socialized. Jacob is socialized in contrast to Esau, not very socialized. Isaac has a preference for Esau, Rebecca for Jacob. There's not a sense that they despised the other children, but just a sense of each having like a clear preference for one child. Uh, we will see Jacob carry this parenting sin into his own family as we will see him have a clear clear uh, preference for Joseph, and we'll get to that. Uh, the reason for Rebecca's preference is not given. Um, Isaac prefers Esau based on his belly, because Esau brings home the bacon. Uh, maybe Rebecca loves Jacob more because Isaac loves him less. I don't know. But uh, it sets the stage for this strife. Esau the hunter comes home one day unsuccessful without any hunt that he's gathered or with, he's, got, he's got no game essentially um, like Jacob is cooking a lentil stew we're told in verse 34 Esau comes in like a hot mess he's like the word let me have is like let me gulp down halite, to swallow greedily he's like let me gulp down some of that red stuff um, because I am a yap which is faint or weary from exertion and hunger Okay, so from these words, how does Esau come across? What do you, what's the picture that's given to us of him? You could throw out some Diabetic. words. Diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. She comes across as diabetic. This is so funny. Okay, hangry for sure. Yeah. How, how else? What, is, what does his personality seem like that we gather? Rash, yeah. Aggressive. Aggressive, yeah. Maybe impulsive, right? He's, he's bronze and not brains. <laughs> Brawn and not brains. I like that. Awesome. He's uh, the so deceitful and clever Jacob is so uh, sure you can have some stew, but first, verse 31, you have to do what? Sell me your birthright. Okay, so what is a birthright? So I went in and looked at this a little bit. Um, commentator Kenneth Matthews and his common, um, his commentary in Genesis, I'll read a quote from him. Societies of the ancient Near East typically recognize the oldest son. It's called primogenitor. Primogenitor, if you ever hear that in big theological speak, simply means oldest son. By granting him privilege, which usually involved inheritance rights of the youngest sons. In Israel, the firstborn offspring, whether animal or human, belonged to God, as did the first fruits of the harvest. Israel itself was the firstborn of the Lord. His first, his first child, essentially. That's the just allusions. Apparently, the firstborn son receives special honor because he symbolized his father's power and potency. Precisely what the birthright consisted of, this is again commentator Matthews, precisely what the birthright consisted of for Esau and Jacob is unknown. Other than Mosaic law, the right of the firstborn entail, entailed a double share of the father's bequest, of the father's inheritance. 
Whatever the light included, it must have been viewed as very valuable to Jacob's ambitions. Commentator James Montgomery Boyce points out, he adds some more, that um, birthright for Abe's family in particular also involved the idea of passing on the blessing. That God's special relationship, special covenant, was passed to specific son, to specific son. So in ancient Near Eastern culture, birthright in any sense of blessing would go to the oldest child. That would just be the assumed person it would go to. But that's not how God works. God doesn't just necessarily work according to what our societal norms are. He chooses out of grace. So impatient, impulsive Esau thinks he's about to die. So, you know, there's no reason not to lose his birthright. He better, better to lose his birthright and live uh, than die with birthright intact is the way he's thinking. But he's trading lentils for a birthright. It just seems so so rash, right? Jacob is cold and calculating. Esau is rash. An oath is sworn. Esau just gorges himself and then exits quickly like stage right. Um, the author, Moses, then adds his own commentary. He says, what do we conclude about Esau? Verse 34. Verse 34. We conclude he what? He despised his birthright. So despise, Baza, his birthright means to undervalue. He did not value his birthright. It can refer to a range of intensity from neglect to utter scorn. The commentator Matthew surmises, by this incident, the author implies that Esau's decision regarding his religious heritage disqualified him to succeed his father. The implication, Esau doesn't value the covenant blessing of the Lord. So that's this implication. He doesn't value it. He thinks that I can just trade it for some stew because I'm hungry. So he seems not to value his special relationship with God. His father Abe and, and dad Isaac have had this special covenant relationship with the Lord that he would have seen. So the Apostle Paul in Romans, it's interesting, uses the story of the twins to talk about faith and election. The God elects us or calls us not based on our works, not based on anything good we have done, but simply on his own gracious love for us. This is Romans 9, 11 through 12. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she, Rebecca, was told, the older will serve the younger. So it's about grace and it's about election. Uh, Commentator Matthews gives his explanation saying, the calling of Jacob over Esau, since both had the same mother, showed that salvation of Jews was never based on ethnic privilege, but always and only on the mercies of God. That the Jews had retained benefit, being the recipients of God's initial revelation, was due to the historical reality of Israel's place in the covenant, but the children of promise were those Jews who were persons of faith. Only by this means could Gentiles too be counted among the children of the promise. If it were not, root, if it were not rooted in ethnic boundaries or personal good works, then on what basis are God's mercies bestowed? So if, if God's love for us is not based on what ethnic identity we come from, if it's not based on the good or bad things that we've done, then what is his mercy based on? It's just, and Paul's answer is divine purpose and calling. We can derive from this assurance that the salvation bestowed on Christians today is not predetermined by one's ethnicity. God's salvation is available to all persons, Jew and Gentile. And to be sure, the heart of Christ's commission is that the church harvest members of faith from all nations. So we see in them the sense of God's calling and election, not based on who your mom is, who your dad is. It's not based on the good or the bad things you've done because the twins were called before they were even born. So they hadn't done anything good or bad. God simply desired, for some reason we don't know, that the blessing would go through son um, Jacob. So Esau doesn't value his covenant relationship with God. That's what is really being brought out by the sense of he despised his birthright. Jacob does value it, but his method for obtaining it is sinful scheming. He values it. He wants it. He realizes it's important to have this blessing from the Lord, but he decides to bring it about his own way. So 
if God says something will happen, it will happen. But he wants to do it his own way. So what should, have, should Jacob have done? What should he have done? Because the blessing was his. It was prophesied that it would be his. So what should he have done? Wait. Wait. He should have waited on the Lord. Waited for the Lord to bring it about in his own timing and his own way. So his desire was good. The problem was how he enacted it. Um, if, um, if the Pentateuch is about Jesus, how does this account of Jacob and Esau point to Jesus? What do you ladies think? What do we learn about Jesus through the story of Jacob and Esau? Or what do we learn about ourselves? Well, uh, his crucifixion was a crime of the Say that again. The God determined when he was going to come. About John the yeah, you're right. That God's timing is always perfect, um, and especially with Christ, that God determined the exact perfect time. You know, that is such a great answer. And when we did some of our New Testament series, we even talked about that, about how Jesus came at the absolute perfect time, because before that, there was no time in history that his um, message of salvation could have been spread across the entire empire, the Roman Empire before then. There's no time in history. It was, well, no. You got me on a side note, but it was uh, it was as um, Koine Greek. They had the first time in history that everyone spoke the same language. They had roads that went throughout the entire Roman Empire, and so that people could travel safely. There was one empire, so that there was safety. You didn't run into civil wars everywhere. We had written scrolls, so they could write letters. It's just amazing how exactly at the appointed time. So that was a great comment that God's plan happens at the appointed time. That's beautiful. What do we learn about grace and works through Esau and Jacob? How are we saved? Grace. grace. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by anything good we've done. Jacob is not saved because he does everything right. He clearly doesn't. He has good intentions, but he brings it about the wrong way. So God's love for us is based on his mercy, not on anything that we have done. When you said that Jacob should have done it a different way. Have I, it reminds me of, you know, Boaz and what's her name? Yes. And they they kind of trick. And then also um, the prostitute, Rahab. Rahab. She let the guys down. She lied. So I, I think it's kind of an interaction of getting things done. I mean, they weren't called bad in the Bible. They said, oh, they should do this, but they shouldn't have. I mean, maybe it was God's will that he tricked this. I mean, I'm just saying, it could be. God does use us despite all of our <laughs> foibles. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you brought up Rahab because one of the commentators I was reading was actually commenting and, and saying that in their perspective it was a different situation because she was protecting them, from, um, the spies from death. She wasn't sort of scheming um, to bring this sort of situation about, about. But it is interesting, you're right, because in that situation, lying seems to have been the right choice. Um, so and it's, it's a great thing, like even if, uh, would be a great discussion point at your table is like, you know, are there times where we lie? Like, are... Was Rebecca a believer yet? Was Rebecca a believer? That's the no, question. Rebecca was, but Rahab wasn't. Rahab wasn't a believer. That's a good... So she kind of falls outside of those rules because they, they weren't meant for her until she became a believer. Hmm. It's a good observation. Let's return to that conversation. Um, so... Ladies, uh, included in our text today was Genesis 27, which is the account of the stolen blessing. And I, I'm not going to go into that too much because I know you ladies probably know that story. I might start with a little bit next week. But really, the whole idea is that Isaac is getting older, and he decides to pass on the blessing of the Lord before he dies. He chooses Esau to pass the blessing to. Now, is Isaac supposed to pass the blessing to Esau? No, he's been told that the blessing goes to, to Isaac. So why? And so Rebecca knows the blessing should go to a Jacob. I mean, yes, to Jacob. And she schemes to ensure it's passed on. It's the exact same situation. So Jacob will only participates in this scheme. And again, what are they showing? They're showing that they don't trust in the Lord to bring things about in his way, in his timing. So Rebecca and Jacob do succeed in tricking Isaac. And the blessing is passed to Jacob. 
Um, the saddest part of this story is when Esau later comes in, Isaac realizes he's been fooled, and Esau says, don't you have a blessing for me too? Bless me, Father. It's like the saddest like line in that. Um, he, so Isaac sins by not blessing the son the Lord has chosen. Because, and it's interesting, one person I was reading was saying, and notice how he even does it in secret. Like, he's like, I'm just going to secretively bless uh, Esau. Most of the time when blessings and birthrights were passed on, it was like this really big feast. It was a very public celebration. But he does it privately. And then Rebecca and Jacob, they interview. Um, so... It's interesting that uh, commentator Boyce mentions, I thought this was so great, he says, anytime we sin to seemingly expand the work of the Lord, it's still sin. Anytime that we sin, even if we think we're bringing about God's will, even if we think we're doing his work, it's still sin. So you ladies can read that story on your own time, and um, we'll, I'll decide if I go into it a little bit. I know it's a story you ladies probably know. And if you have any questions, we can talk about it too. Um, but then pretty much what we'll pick up next week is that Isaac realizes he, well, that Esau is now out for him. Or sorry, even I get the names confused. Jacob realizes that Esau now wants to kill him because he stole his birthright, and so he's going to flee, and he's going to take the journey back up to Laban and his household. So that's what we'll pick up next week. So um, questions for you ladies to, to discuss at your tables. Um, I gave you two. Um, first, through Abraham's servant, we learned that prayer is, one, asking for wisdom to see God's will, and two, direct and specific. Um, I encourage you ladies to share a time in your own life where you pray for specific direction and how God answered it. I think it's really encouraging to hear the stories of each other, of how we have prayed and how God has answered. Another question for you ladies to share about is, through the accounts of Esau and Jacob, we see people behaving very badly to try and bring about God's will. Is there somewhere in your life where God may want you to wait on him instead of act? So pray, and you can pray with the other ladies at your table about any of those situations. So um, I will leave you ladies to discuss, and then um, I will I'll do a close in prayer, and then let's let you ladies, any that can stay, stay to about 1045 and chat a little bit. And enjoy some time together. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we have had looking at your word and diving deep into it. And I pray that your truth will just rest on our hearts and our minds as we go from here today. That we will um, continue to meditate and think about these stories and why you chose them to be in your word. Why Moses, through inspiration, put them there. Help us to continue to ponder them and to see your work in your hand in your teaching through all of it and help us to leave here encouraged in our hearts. And I just ask that you um, will give us a deep sense of your presence as we go from here and give us opportunities to love, bless, and encourage other people in our lives today. In your name we pray. Amen.